FX Medicine is a proud supporter of the 2021 AIMA Virtual Conference. This year's AMIA Conference will be held in a virtual forum on Saturday and Sunday, the 27th and 28th of March, 2021. This year's theme is Rebuilding Health, Community, Resilience and Joy, an Integrative Medicine Approach and will include live and pre-recorded presentations from integrative medicine experts from across the world. For more information and to book your tickets, please visit amia.net.au. This podcast is intended as healthcare practitioner education only and is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Joining us on the line again today is Beth Bundy. She's a qualified naturopath of over 19 years specialising in integrative and functional medicine. Beth worked previously as technical consultant with PathLab, one of Australia's original functional pathology companies, and currently trains health practitioners nationally as clinical consultant at NutriPath Integrative Pathology Services. Beth also works as a functional medicine practitioner in a busy and highly successful integrative medical practice. Welcome back to FX Medicine. Beth, how are you? I'm very good. I'm back again. We're back again and we're talking about hormones. We're talking about estrogen metabolites this time, clinical interpretation. I'm going to warn our listeners right from the get-go, we are going to be scratching the surface of this. There is so much more to this. It's intertwined with so many other hormones and interlinked. That's right. And once I get started, hang on to your hats, guys. (laughs) There's a lot to say. (laughs) Well, first, let's define and differentiate estrogens from their metabolites. Because I remember myself getting caught up with 17 beta estradiol because that's all I knew. And I argued back and forth because I was coming from this reference point, which was incorrect. Well, we'll talk like lay people, or not lay people, but just how ordinary people speak. And let's just (laughs) boil it down to... So it's easier to remember simple words. So let's just remember that we have three main estrogens, estradiol, which forevermore we shall call E2, estrone, E1, as well as estriol, E3. So I'm just going to call them E1, 2, and 3, if everyone's okay with that. Now, we know that estrogen play an important role in our reproductive um, tissues, healthy bones, uh, they also help with neurotransmitters in the brain and keeping our cardiovascular system healthy, so that's all lovely. But then they also have different nuances of what those main three do. And I want people to remember that E3 is the major estrogen in pregnant women, So, and it's also usually the most uh, abundant estrogen in the urine of women when we measure them. But predominantly, you should see that more elevated um, with in pregnancy, more than the others. Um, it's also been examined for its role in bone and lipid metabolism, as well as a, um, they called it a neurosteroid, which is basically regulates neurotransmission and is neuroprotective. Um, and it's also considered less estrogenic than the other E1s and E2s. And E2 is seen as the more biologically active estrogen and that comes from the ovarian cells and is regulated by FSH. Now in men, because remember that men do have estrogen as well, um, in so in blokes and pre pubescent children. Mm. Yes, thank you. E two comes mainly from estrogen. In menstruating women, so we've got our pre and post women when we're talking about estrogen. So in our pre Menopausal women, E2 comes predominantly from testosterone, metabolized from testosterone, with others um, conversion of testosterone in peripheral tissue. And um, the concentrations of this peak around mid-cycle, around ovulation, of course, then they decline. There's a smaller little rise in the luteal phase. But then in post-menopausal women, 
most of the E2 that is still made comes from E1. So E1 and E2 can kind of cross-pollinate from each other. We really need pictures again. Can everyone see me cross-pollinating <laughs> E2 and E1? I'm, I'm, draw, I'm drawing the diagram for people. I'm going to put some diagrams uh, up on the FX Medicine website for people. Yeah, mm. a, it's a flow, you know, it's a pathway that this becomes this becomes this sort of thing. So, um, And then E1, <clears throat> again, is reversibly converted to E2 um, through a 17-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. Let's just say it's an enzyme. Um, now, circulating E1 levels are relatively high when we're born in both men and women. It decreases postnatally and then increases again during puberty. In premenopause women, E1 is pre- predominantly produced by the conversion of androstenedione in the ovary, which androstenedione is another hormone above testosterone in our pathway. Um, and these concentrations peak uh, before ovulation, similar to E2. And in post-menopause women, E1 becomes the predominant estrogen. So E2 more in the menstruating women and E1 <clears throat> post-menopause. And in these ladies and men and children, E1 is largely produced, again, by the conversion of androstenedione in peripheral tissue, right? so not the ovary. So then regarding the estrogen metabolites, which come from E1, 2, and 3, these are metabolized by three competitive pathways involving irreversible hydroxylation by your cytochrome P450 or your CYP gene, um, or CYP enzyme, sorry. Uh, you've got CYP 1A1, 1B1, 1A2. They're a bit like bananas in pajamas. Um, <laughs> and then we have E1 and E2 are converted to catechol estrogen, which are your hydroxy. Your 2-hydroxy E1, your 4-hydroxy E1, your 2-hydroxy E2, and your 4-hydroxy E2. Estrone and estradiol get 2 and 4-hydroxy versions. And then we have the 16-hydroxy, which is uh, then moves on to make E3, which we talked about before. So the catechol estrogens, which from here on out I will call the hydroxys, um, are further metabolized or methylated by um, the COMPT enzyme, the catechol or methyltransferase, to your methoxy estrogen. So now your two and fours become two methoxy and four methoxy E1 and E2. So there's a lot of, you know, kids in the house when it comes to your estrogen metabolite. So what we have to remember too is these hydroxy estrogens are constantly being formed and inactivated by methylation by a COMPT. So this is one reason why it's important to have um, good methylation um, and good COMPT um, you know, processes. So the hydroxys and their methoxys are then sulfated and glucuronidated in the liver, which then increases their solubility in the blood, their clearance rate and elimination in the urine and the stool. Right, so I want people to remember it doesn't just come out of the urine. Mm. It comes in the stool as well. Um, now, the liver's ability to properly metabolise is what's really been found to affect the risk of, the, of breast cancer or cancers in, in ladies. Um, and this is because depending on which me- metabolic pathway um, predominates, too much of a certain estrogen metabolite, say the 4-hydroxy, um, can build up and high levels of the 4-hydroxy and to a lesser extent sometimes the 2s, <clears throat> and especially if there's decreased methylation, this is highly associated with um, increased breast cancer risk as those hydroxy estrogens can oxidise to highly reactive quinones um, and these, uh, especially with glutathione levels alone, uh, can bind to DNA, cause mutations that can lead to cancer. Okay, we've spoken you know, majorly about the liver. Is the conversion only done in the liver? Uh, no. So estrogens are metabolised in two phases, phase one, which is your hydroxylation, and phase two, your methylation. Um, in addition to uh, methylation, the parent estrogen, so 
when we talk about parent estrogens, that's when we're talking E1, E2 and 3. And hydroxys, as I said, are conjugated to make them more soluble and excreted in wee and poo. Um, but the first metabolism of estrogens, which is the hydroxylation by the CYP101 and 1B1, they're mainly expressed in liver and breast tissue. Um, but, but ultimately, since most CYP uh, enzymes are expressed in the liver, the majority of the metabolism of estrogens is in the liver. Um, but we have to remember that it does happen in other tissues. I also want to say the major metabolite of E2 or 2-hydroxy E2 um, is mainly catalyzed by CYP1A2 and 3A4 in the liver, but um, the banana and pajama 1A1 is in extra hepatic tissues. Um, 1B1, the other banana, is highly expressed in estrogen target tissue. So that's where, like I mentioned, breast, but also ovary and uterus. And that one specifically catalyzes 4-hydroxy. And um, when 4-hydroxy is properly methylated, so again, just reiterating that we need to have those methylation pathways up to scratch or we need to assess those when we're also looking at um, aberrant estrogen metabolites. So if 4-hydroxy is properly methylated to 4-methoxy, it's, it's relatively benign because it's um, easily eliminated and the risks are low. The problem is when methylation is um, inadequate and there becomes a build-up of this 4-hydroxy. Um, and interestingly, uh, equine-based estrogens, so your um, replacement therapies, do increase this metabolism into 4-hydroxy. Um, so that's, again, something to be mindful of when you're treating women on that. Um, and, and and the 4-hydroxy, remember we said that's the problem that can call, uh, move into the quinone form, which um, increase risk for breast and endometrial cancer risk. Yeah, and hyperplasia. I mean, this this is the whole issue of um, tamoxifen, is that it's a, a selective estrogen receptor modifier in the breast, but unfortunately, you have a runaway effect in the uterus, and um, yeah. this is where the, the, you know, the further issues come down the line. It's activated. It's a 4-hydroxylation issue. So we'll get to that later when we're talking about how we can intercede, how we can help people with this, mm -hmm. but I think yeah. it's really yeah. interesting, this interplay with our genomics, that this is one area where further research can lead to um, helping people who are in a subset. And this might also explain why when you look at population studies, some of these estrogen metabolite studies, don't they don't have a really strong story. And, the, and mm. so medicine will go, therefore, it doesn't exist. Well, no, it does exist, but only in this sort of population who've got the issues. Yeah, there's, <clears throat> there's quite a lot of subgroups that it is positive for and then uh, uh, larger groups that it's not. So, yeah, it, it it all gets a bit messy and it's all a bit confusing. Oh, absolutely. Um, when we talk about the metabolites. Yeah. To me, I was a, I was so sceptical at the beginning about, you know, having your gene SNPs tested and, and what that was going to mean and people going down paranoid pathways that, that they've got a real issue. But now I just see it as it's a tool. It's a clinical yeah. tool. There's like a, a background baseline that if there's another issue surfacing, you might want to look at that and go, hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And this is where it's not just the comp, you know. It's yes. the MAO. It's the... It's your CYP genes too. So we talk about CYP enzymes, all the bananas and pajamas, but it's also their genes that are potentiating that. So this is why it's not so easy. And even when people do a test on metabolites and then they treat it and then that they don't get the results they want, it's not just as easy as throw dim at something and everything will be better no. because of all these other things that we're talking about. Yeah, so maybe we should go back in, into the metabolites a little bit more so. Let's do that. So let's look at the functions and the actions of the mainly the E2 metabolites. So as we said before, or as I said before, um, the, the 16 and the 4 are relatively more estrogenic and have more toxic potential than the 2-hydroxy, um, which are considered to have little estrogenic or even anti-estrogenic properties in some parts. So there's actually some evidence from cell from cell studies using um, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer cells that two hydroxy 
E1 and E2 inhibit cell growth and proliferation and that the two hydroxy metabolites have been associated with normal cell differentiation and apoptosis. So this is probably where this whole 2-hydroxy is a good estrogen has come from. Um, and a high rate of clearance, if you've got a good COMPT enzyme, leads to a lower um, potency um, in the estrogen target tissue, yep. um, your breast, uterus, etc. And then, and going through the methoxy. So if, if all that works well, that has been shown to also inhibit carcinogenic um, cancer production by suppressing cell proliferation and angiogenesis, which is great. With the four hydroxy, um, that has mainly is the big baddie for the cancer potential because it has this um, ability to cause DNA damage by forming these depurinating adducts. Uh, which cause oxidative damage and can initiate the cancer. Uh, it is also shown that um, ratios of the DNA adducts to their parent estrogen, so their B1, 2 and 3, were significantly higher in women with breast cancer. Um, and plus, obviously, if the comp enzyme is inhibited, then you're going to have more 4-hydroxy as well. So that it, we've got to make sure the methylation is pushing that 4-hydroxy through to the 4-methoxy so it's inactive, so to speak. Your 16-hydroxy is another potential tumour uh, initiator. Um, animal studies have shown that um, u- high um, urinary concentrations of the 16-hydroxy was um, increased proliferation of the mammary cells, oncogene expression and and breast tumour um, incidence. And <clears throat> another study on human breast tissue found that um, 16 hydroxy levels were eightfold higher in um, breast cancer of the, what do you call it, the duct, the lobular duct, yep. than nearby fat tissue in the, in the breast. Um, and these sorts of things can be elevated through obesity um, hypothyroidism, uh, pesticide toxicity, or really kind of most environmental toxicity, excess omega-6 fatty acids, and, and general inflammatory cytokine ranging around the body. So the, the two is considered safer, four not so much because of the DNA um, mutation potential, mm, mm. and the 16 we don't want that high. How strong is the evidence for cancer causation and, conversely, protection when you're looking at um, the supplements and the various ways that we can protect against 4-hydroxylation, for instance? Mm. There's quite a bit of, when I started digging around studies, there are quite a lot of studies and they are mm, somewhat contradictory or it's a bit mixed, yeah. But firstly, before I say that, I want to say that most of the research on breast cancer and the um, estrogen metabolites uh, on pre and post women really can't be extrapolated to women on any form of estrogen replacement. Most of this, um, the way we interpret any results of testing these um, metabolites, is on women not taking. Uh, estrogen therapy, yep. right? Or because it, it's more about how, on a baseline, how that directly or indirectly affects level, um, estrogen metabolites. So most of these studies are on people not on stuff. So yeah. the caveat there is: don't necessarily use this for pe- for women taking estrogen replacement therapy. This is not necessarily going to protect them. No, because yep. it's then we bring in sex hormone binding globulin and all those. Yeah, you know, it changes the yeah. eating of what we're producing and yeah. excreting. Yeah. Um, so now it's known that women not supplementing with um, estrogen with high level of 4 hydroxys are associated with breast cancer. But the controversy is still persisting regarding that the 16 <coughs> hydroxy and its relationship to the 2. So this 2-16 uh, hydroxy ratio. So previously, so previous research um, decided that a low 2 to 16 ratio uh, was associated with increased breast risk um, 
breast cancer risk, so having a low 2 and a high 16. However, more recently, researchers said that um, <clears throat> that a high 16, which you, which gives you your low 2 to 16, yep. is associated with a slight increase in breast cancer risk in premenopausal women, but a lower risk in postmenopausal. So um, practitioners need to be aware of when they're reading results, they need to interpret it with depending on the menopausal status. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. it is going to change what that may mean. And also when you're looking at breast cancer in totality, which fraction of breast cancer are we looking at? What, what about the um, estrogen negative receptor? What about the estrogen and progesterone negative receptor cancers? There's actually been a positive association observed for 2-hydroxy yeah. and a ratio among women with a, um, estrogen or progesterone negative, negative. tumours. Okay. Yeah, so high numbers for either of the 2 or the 2-16 ratio were associated with triple the relative risk for this, for this subgroup. Mm. So mm. when we're talking about the subgroups of breast cancer patients because they use this stu- um, that study was from one using um, blood samples, so blood samples, not urine, blood samples from uh, the nurses' health study. Yep. And um, so they compared two 16 levels in breast cancer patients and controls. And at that time, neither estrogen metabolite appeared to change breast cancer risk, nor did the ratio between the two metabolites make a difference. Yep. However, the negative, the uh, estrogen or progesterone negative tumours, it, it did have a... Um, oh, that's interesting. ...an association. So, yeah, this is why it's all kind of... Oh, you know, um, tricky. So we certainly haven't got to the end of it. We're really at the beginning of discovering, or let's say midway through, <laughs> discovering what these metabolites do and their function. But I, th- I think what what we've got to be mindful of as practitioners is that we're dealing with a patient who has a personal history, and in all cases, the family history and the and the the relevant medical history are the dominant things that we've got to take into consideration. Yeah. Yes, very much so. That's Can't treat a test. Exactly. And I think this is where um, this whole Just 216 is missing a, a large part of the story. So, you know, an, another study tested this two is good, 16 is bad hypothesis. Yeah. But they studied this in relation to endometrial cancer. Um, and they found that there was no association observed for the um, 216 ratio. In endometrial cancer, yeah. so which is interesting, and another um, meta-analysis. Um, I think they they had like um, eleven hundred cancer patients and eighteen hundred controls. They had a non-significant association, at suggesting a possible weak protective effect in premenopausal, but not in postmenopausal. Gotcha. Uh, and again, this is studying blood, so in in a lot of these um, studies, they, they look at blood. Basically, they were saying the circulating metabolites are not associated with breast risk, uh, breast cancer risk. I think part yeah. of this story is that it also disses once and for all the myth of E2 dominance, of estrogen dominance. We've just got to get rid of that term because you can see risk in people who have, in women especially, who have lower estrogen levels relative to progesterone, which is normally what they're talking about, yeah. but it can still cause a problem. So it's not necessarily a, an estrogen dominant issue, but it certainly can be an estrogen driven issue. What about more recent evidence with regards to um, these estrogen metabolites? Uh, well, I found one from um, earlier this year, um, so in March uh, 2018, uh, and they studied over 1,800 pre- and post-menopause uh, ladies and their final wash-up of this was that higher 2 to 16 ratio in pre-menopausal women was suggestive of reduced uh, breast cancer risk overall, even for estrogen receptor negative. Wow, okay. Yeah. And in post-menopausal women, the 2 to 16 was unrelated to breast cancer risk However, the association between 2-hydroxy and risk varied by body mass, so weight comes into it here, clearly, 
Um, and their final comments were that premenopausal urinary 2 hydroxy to 16 hydroxy estrogen, estrogen may play a role in breast uh, cancer. However, larger studies are needed, more studies. Um, and it says then, our findings do not support reduced breast cancer risk with higher postmenopausal 2 to 16 hydroxy estrogen overall, although obesity may modify associations with 2 right. hydroxy. So the association between the circulating, circulating estrogens and breast cancer has been pretty well established as the estrogens as their whole. Um, but um, it's the estrogen metabolite investigations that seem to be mixed from what we have kind of done in the past. What about colorectal cancer? I am I read some research, uh, I think it's from 2013, that said that estrogen and estrogen metabolites, having been initially protective against colorectal cancer, might increase proliferation of colorectal cancer once it is set up, once it's developed. Um, so there's an initial protection and then it says, well, to hell with you. What's your opinion to this, though? Oh, well, one I found from 2015, and that was done on fifteen over 15,000 postmenopausal women, so yep. postmenopausal, yep. so we always have to differentiate that. And they came to the conclusion that circulating estrogens and their metabolites were unrelated to colorectal cancer. This is certainly not ended. There's so much more to delve into, isn't it? Pre and post, what sort of cancer... Yep. Absolutely. And no. what else is going on? Like, I, I think this paints a, a perfect picture that there's multi multiple factors with regards to initiation of any cancer. But when we're thinking about this issue of colorectal cancer, we've got to take into account their diet, their lifestyle, their methylation. Are they obese? There's, you know, you can't just look at estrogen metabolites in its singularity and expect to get a, um, a clear picture. A absolutely. Given that it's one piece of the jigsaw. How do we test for these estrogen metabolites? And you were mentioning blood earlier. What about blood and how accurate is urine testing versus blood? Right. So good question. So estrogen and its metabolites are present in the blood in free unbound form or bound form to your steroid binding proteins like SHBG as well as your um, conjugate. And concentrations of the free form in blood, especially like in postmenopausal women, is in the fentagram um, per milliliter range. Now, I had to look up fentagram because I'd never heard of it, and it is the it puts them in the lowest concentration of an analyte that can be determined with any accuracy. And to put it into context, you need one thousand fentagrams to make a picogram. And you need 1,000 picograms to make a nanogram. Or let us just say, we need 1 billion fentagrams to make one microgram. Yeah. So you can see it's small, not even a smidge <laughs> or a tad. It's infinitesimal amount to measure in blood. But So um, a lot of studies uh, that we can read about are about blood, but they're done in research situations. Yeah? And... Um, Studies on urinary estrogen and metabolites and breast cancer risk on premenopausal women have even suggested that urine is not as relevant as blood to breast tissue exposure. So this is the other thing we have to think about when we're just measuring urine. It's like, but how is that relevant to what's going on in the body? Mm. You know, so they're saying, well, it's not as relevant. Blood is not as sorry that urine is not as relevant as blood when we're thinking about what's happening on in the in the breast. And um, uh, another study showed that average levels of uh, E1 and E2 were significantly higher in breast uh, than in breast tissue than it was in urine. Um, so, and that both the 2 and 16 hydroxy pathways were less represented in breast tissue than in urine. So, you know, there's more in urine than in breast about your um, hydroxies. And there wasn't much of the 4-hydroxy detected in breast tissue, but it was in the urine. So we have to be careful here that we're not getting um, 
you know, swayed by a result which is not necessarily reflective of what's happening in the breast tissue. In the target tissue, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they did find that the 2-16 ratio was similar in urine and breast tissue. So the ratio may be useful to have some idea rather than harping on the 2, 4 and 16 as separate entities. Right, Yeah. right. But ultimately... Urine is the best and easiest for metabolite, mainly because it's really the only commercial test available mm. um, because of the, the blood is more um, as a research purposes. So um, urine is beneficial for some part of the story, but of course we can't use it as the only piece of the puzzle. Yeah, yeah. None of, the, none of these tests are the be-all and end-all. Um, and the other thing is, um, when they did a study on when do you collect this? When do you collect the urine? Uh, so they did a study where they tested early follicular, mid follicular, periovulation, and mid luteal. And this is in premenopausal women, obviously. Um, and they found that the um, 2 to 16 ratio and the 2 to 4 ratio was significantly increased during. Um, around periovulation, so after ovulation and mid luteal. So, you know, that's going to give us our strongest readings then around the luteal phase. So, you know, generally you would say, well, if you want the, the biggest number to read, um, which is helpful because sometimes they don't really say much, then you do want around that luteal phase for the um, menstruating women. And with menopause, you can do it any time, clearly, because they don't have a, a, a cycle. Okay, so when we're talking, given that we want to uh, intercede and we want to modify the metabolism of oestrogen, um, the ratios, um, what agents do you use? What agents do you advocate? What have you seen results with? Because of all the studies that are around and, you know, I went swimming in them um, to talk to you today, there doesn't seem to be enough data to confirm the role of estrogen metabolites as true predictors of breast cancer. Mm. But we can we can say that any intervention which helps reduce circulating levels of the primary estrogen is something to consider because they then become hydroxy and methoxy. Yeah. And this is going to help um, lower risk. Um, so first and foremost, I think we need to remember that we need to look at the parent estrogen as well as the metabolites. Not just go for the metabolites, and that's your answer. Yes. Which um, I know that you know um, people do, practitioners do, but there are some things we can certainly look at. Um, two hydroxy levels are affected by genetics and lifestyle factors, including smoking and weight. We mentioned weight before, and um, increased adiposity has been associated with a reduced two hydroxy, um, whereas a higher two hydroxy has been found in lean women including those with anorexia, interesting, or those who um, do a lot of frequent strenuous exercise. However, exercise generally doesn't increase the 2-16 ratio, mm. except in women with very low initial 2-16 ratio. So losing weight and exercising does seem to shift the production towards a, a 2, the 2-hydroxy. Two yep. um, I have got some bad news, though. Regarding wine and caffeine. So no! everyone take your last Exactly. So depending <laughs> on what time you're listening to this, take your last sip of your finish that glass and finish that mug. Uh, coffee intake has been associated with a higher two uh estrone and sorry, two hydroxy estrone and um hydroxy estradiol. Decaffeinated coffee was not associated with the two hydroxy pathway but more so with the um, 16 and E3, which I thought was interesting. Um, progesterone, iodine and vitamin D have all been shown to increase uh, the 2-hydroxy and decrease the relative concentration of 4-hydroxy. Um, remembering that our 2-hydroxy are created by uh, the SIP 101 banana, uh, and this is activated by the photochemicals found in the cruciferous vegetables, you know, your cauliflower, your broccoli, your cabbage, and God forbid, kale. 
um, and also iodine, progesterone and vitamin D, uh, you know, it's worth considering if the two is low or relatively low to the four, yeah? So you can either assess those levels or just suggest people eat more leafy greens, which is always a good start. Uh, also fibre, um, soluble fibre um, more specifically, has found to um, uh, help with the 16-hydroxy um, levels. And uh, we mentioned before about COMPT. We need to make sure that there's enough cofactors for your um, COMPT enzymes to work. Uh, so that's your B6, B12, uh, folate, betaine and the like. And remembering glutathione, right, because it's so important in the detox um, pathways, especially the quinone estrogen. Um, and, you know, a lot of our patients might be on numerous medications, hormone therapy. They've all got exposure to environmental toxins. They might be smoking. Um, all of these things affect glutathione. Uh, vitamin C is necessary to help glutathione, as is selenium. So all of these things need to be put into the mix when we're talking about metabolite. And um, also, because the 216, you know, has been talked about with breast cancer risk and what have you, uh, and many people know about the cruciferous vegetables because they have things like the indole 3 carbonyl and diindole methane, which is your DIM. So... But now the quandary is, well, because the 216 and the, the metabolites is, is so controversial, I, I don't know what that means for I3C and DIM. You know, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on, on that, Andrew. So my issue is with indole-3-carbonyl as an agent, as a controlled agent. One, you when you, me- when you take I3C orally, you don't measure I3C in the blood. So the the actual activation of I3C is what you're hoping can control the metabolites with. And the problem yeah. is, depending on the stomach acid, depending on digestion and a number of other factors, you can't necessarily control what it condenses to because I3C is a monomer. It wants to condense. What you want it to condense to is DIM, and that's the major yeah. in vivo t- um, um, byproduct that's, that's measured. The problem is, and this was illustrated in a very old study by, I remember the author, Zhu and Connie, um, in, uh, I think it was 1998. And what they were talking about is the problem is indolocarbazol. If you yeah. get that um, upregulated condensation product, then you're going to increase the four series of estrogens, depending on the research that was cited, dogs or, or, or humans, you know, between four and tenfold. That's bad. So um, I remember talking, or there was a, this was a blog that I, I did sort of, and Christine Horton um, chimed in and she said, so this is why she prefers um, broccoli sprout extract um, mm-hmm. because she prefers that it's a controlled thing, a balanced thing with other um, beneficial agents in there, not just one, one knife, if you like, of DIM versus I3C. So my product, uh, I'm sorry, my other problem with indole-3-carbonyl is that it upregulates site3A4 um, and therefore you've got multiple drug detoxification issues. So in what patient are you going to use this? Now, if you're sure, fine. But if you're not, I think the be all and end all with all of this is you've got to do a test if you're going to use these agents at baseline and at, say, two, three months to show a treatment difference. And if you can't show a treatment difference or if it's going the wrong way, then for goodness sake, stop. But in no case should you be resting on either of these agents as the magic agent to go with. They're never yeah, the magic that, agent. Yeah, and that's what I... I find that when I'm talking to practitioners, that seems to be the go-to. As soon as you say estrogen metabolite, it's I3C and DIN. And, and I agree totally with that, um, the conversion of I3C. We can't measure it in the in the blood. Um, and it does turn to that indolocarbazole, which is, it's a dioxin-like molecule. Mm. Now, mm. dioxin is poison, mm. um, you know. So, yeah, it, it it is problematic. and so. 
I personally don't jump to that as my first port of call. The, the first port of call should always be things like exercise and diet. Um, what yeah. about, what about you mentioned vitamin D before, what about midday sun exposure for five to 15 yeah. minutes? I mean, you know, yeah. what about, as you said, fibre? I mean, these should be the go-to things. Yeah, and, and like you say, they're not the be-all and end-all and that's not going to fix all your problems. And that this is probably when people are using O3C, why sometimes they um, do a baseline and treat and then are saying, oh, the results are worse or um, haven't moved. And it could be because, well, you're not converting to DIM, uh, you're converting to the other Oh, um, what about Cont? What about your methylation issues? What about, yeah. it, it, yeah. we're not even talking about these today, but there's so many other, you, you mentioned the neurotransmitter sort of action. It, I think yeah. the whole thing with any hormone is, it's not a hormone in isolation. It's a hormone in a complicated network of interplay. And you've got to think really seriously about that when you're going to upset it. Yeah. And, and, and bottom line, good old practitioners love the gut. You know, this is the other thing we've got to consider. I think this is, is yeah. apart from what they're eating, is the microbiome because, again, they've done some studies um, and found that um, the levels of urine estrogen and metabolites in men and postmenopausal women yep. um, was strongly associated with um, fecal microbiome richness and diversity. Yeah. So there's another issue. What then in influences that? Exercise, sleep, vegetables. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But interestingly, when they measured the pre-menopausal women, so the menstruating ladies, mm. because they were collected across various times of the menstrual cycle and were highly variable, they've come up and said, and well, that's unrelated to their estrogen levels are unrelated to the microbiome. Oh, really? <laughs> unrelated. Unrelated. It was all too hard. It was all too variable. So, which we know the microbiome varies. You know, it can do on a day to day basis. So, um, yeah. But it, it's all of those things need to be put into. And it it is a bit like when um, people say that you know sometimes the way we're going with our supplements, we we are just a natural doctor. We're still prescribing pills um, and forgetting the tenets of, like you said, sleep diet, you know, laughter, sunshine, all those sorts of things. And the naturopathic axiom of treat the gut and the liver. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think we have to remember too that as uh, naturopathic practitioners, you know, we're often ahead of the curve in translating new theories or scientific literature and we can be an early adopter, which has its, um, you know, merits. And sometimes we find help to help our patients when regular medicine has yet to develop a, a drug or treatment. Um, and because we limit our interventions to relatively non-toxic, low-risk therapies, sometimes I think we have a low requirement of proof before experimenting with new ideas. Yeah. That's sort of like, oh, well, it might help, won't hurt you, let's have a go. Um, and so but what we need to do is we can be an early adopter with a new idea, but if it doesn't pan out, so if you keep using I3C and you're not getting changes, maybe you need to let it go, mm. you know, and, and see what else. So, and especially I think, you know, today we've shown that there's not an absolute linear decision about cancer risk and these hormones, especially the metabolites. So it's a lot more complex than we first thought. So I think we need to kind of step away a little bit about uh you know, a, a test result equaling cancer or not and um, kind of look at all the other things that play a part in in how that result came to be. Well, we've spoken about a heap of resources and papers, which, you know, are still controversial and sometimes contradictory. Um, what other further resources are there, Beth? Well, I can... Uh pass on all the uh, study papers that I, I looked at mm -hmm. and um, that mentioned today and we can put that up on the on the um, website. We'll definitely put those up on the so website. people can read, you know, keep themselves awake at night reading about it. <laughs> or put themselves to sleep and get some... <laughs> and <laughs> and yeah. benefit their estrogen metabolism. Yes, yeah, so and maybe they should just have their last sneaky wine and uh, coffee before they get stuck into their... <laughs> 
party cruciferous vegetable. Well, we've certainly covered a lot. We've covered, you know, morning exercise and diet, uh, obviously the, the givers of health. We should get some vitamin D, preferably at midday, only for a short amount of time though. And we should include those naturopathic axioms of treating the gut and the liver and making sure that we're getting adequate fibre, which is a lot, um, and that we should also be cautious of bananas. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks very Absolutely. much. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. FX Medicine is evolving. As we continue to grow, it's important to us that we remain clinically relevant to your practice. So if you know of an expert you want to hear from, let us know. You can contact us on fxmedicine.com.au, Facebook or Instagram.